All right, take it away, Karen. Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, it's been a really fun morning and um, I'm very fortunate that my husband's here in the other room with the kids. So hopefully we will have few, if no interruptions. Um, so I have selected several artworks from the Nerman Museum of Contemporary Art to show and talk about, um, but I hope that you will feel free to create during the whole session. Um, I've got just a few collage materials that I've gathered in addition to my favorite markers and pens. Um, the session is called uh, Personal Portraits and I've grabbed a snapshot that my mother sent. I think um, my mom and I are probably among the minority <laughs> people who still print photos. And she also prints them herself on her printer at home and sends them in greeting cards. So happy birthday, here's a picture of you and your family. So um, here's an example of what I've got to work with. Um, and I have to unblur my background to focus it. So it's just a, a little like a four by five printout of a family snapshot that uh, my mom took for my birthday. And it's actually on a greeting card background that I'm repurposing. So um, yes, feel free to create along the way. And um, yeah, I hope to have some discussion too. I know the tours that we do in person are always very interactive. Hopefully it's like 50-50. Um, tour guide talk time and participant talk time, lots of questions. So I hope if there is a question in the chat that I don't see, um, somebody will interrupt. Um, I also have five videos that I'm gonna show. They're very short videos, all under three minutes. And I put the links in the um, Google Classroom. So you'll be able to find those. A few of the videos are longer, but I tried to select a chunk that most pertains to the image that we'll be showing. Um, so here we go. I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, hey, I'm working from home today. So if I were at work, this is where I'd be at the Nerva Museum of Contemporary Art. We're on the campus of Johnson County Community College in Overland Park, Kansas. And so these are uh, portraits of the 10 artists whose works I'm gonna be showing. Um, I like to print off a picture of the artist to show during a tour sometimes. It can be helpful um, just for context, especially um, with contemporary art. A lot of the artists are still alive. So you can say, this is what this person looks like. Um, students perhaps can relate to that, you know, that artist um, in different ways and um, kind of just humanizes the piece a little bit instead of just seeing their artwork and then reading about it on the, the wall label. So we've got um, top left to right, we've got Patrick Martinez, Jackie Sococcio, Roberto Lugo, Genevieve Gagnard, Eve Arnold. And then on the bottom, we've got Roger Shimamura, Diego Romero, Marcus Ammerman, and Ken Williams, and Jordan Ann Craig. All right, so this one is a detail. This is one of the fun things about virtual tours. Instead of seeing it in person, you can focus in on the details. And this is the work by Patrick Martinez. Um, it actually has uh, neon as well as a scrolling component. And so I'm gonna try to see if I can pull this up gracefully. Okay. Whoops, thank you so much for the gracefully part. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. Y'all see the word scrolling across there? Yes, we can see it scrolling. It's alive. It's a mixed media artwork that plugs into the wall.
I'm sure everybody recognizes fried chicken. There's also lumpia, adobo, some other foods. So um, there's the family portraits that Patrick Martinez has included in his work beyond, behind the neon. A lot of people don't see them right away. So let's see, I'm gonna try this again. So here's the work in its entirety. So you can see that that inset with the neon, family portraits, and then the scrolling screen there are all part of this painting, multimedia painting. Um, I also have a list of the artworks that I uploaded because there's a lot of detail. And I think there are some that I didn't put that little caption there. It's a lot to write down. Um, so this is a work called Sold Old Merchant God from 2020. Um, I will say that a lot of times um, children will notice the photographs. And if they don't, we ask them, where do you see photographs? And then they'll take a closer look. Um, we also have a layer and layer of things that are um, whitewashed over so you can barely see it. There's the, um, the Aztec God on the right that's been painted over. A lot of times the kids will say, that looks like something I've seen at Chipotle in the, um, the decor. Um, there's also the roses that are ceramic and spray painted. There's tiles, there's banners. So there's all sorts of different things. Um, on the surface here. And I wanted to share a little bit about the artist from his own words. With the work that I'm trying to do, I mean, with the work that I'm doing in the landscape pieces, um, especially the piece back behind me, I'm trying to create a third space. Um, I'm from a mixed uh, background. My dad is Native American and Mexican. Um, by way of Chihuahua, Mexico, more indigenous. Um, and my mother was from the Philippines. So that complex kind of mixture as a kid, there was a lot of ambiguity there and um, people wanting to put you in some kind of packaging or like put you in, you know, just some kind of like box. And, you know, they want, you know, America likes to do that and they want to digest you quickly and understand you quickly and say, oh, this is what you, yeah, 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 I got it. You know, I know who you are. So um, growing up like that and having to identify as one thing leaves no room from complexity and to complicate things and to make things, you know, um, to, to capture those nuances and those complexities is something that I'm trying to do in the work. Um, in my experience here in America, um, having that ambiguity or living with that ambiguity and, and then that, that kind of like all this complex kind of, um, you know, like a race kind of talk as a child, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. And it's something that I'm trying to investigate in the work, creating that third space. What does that look like? Um, so it's something that I'm doing currently. So the materials that I'm selecting for what I'm working on, like I'm thinking about um, adding to the composite conversation of like painting or sculpture. So I'm thinking about materials in the city that can be sculpture, can be painting. Um, and what I'm selecting from is where I'm living or what's around me. And when I'm selecting those things, they come with uh, baggage. You know what I mean? And I know that so I'm using that. And, you know, I think me having a last name like Martinez, me being brown, growing up like that, they have already kind of pack packaged me. And when I make art, um, that's something that they will also kind of do. We get it, your ghetto, your uh, graffiti writer, your street. It's like, um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I did graffiti back in the day and things like that, but there's more complex kind of um, conversations that I'm trying to have um, using materials and, and the spaces that I know. And, um, you know, trying to, trying to transcend and trying to like really uh, make people see these discounted um, objects, spaces, people, 
in different ways, different perspectives, give them um, a dynamic kind of point of view. And like, damn, I never really looked at it like that. Or I look at this material differently now. Um, things that... All right. He goes on um, to talk more specifically about working with neon artists. Um, and it really is kind of fascinating because I don't think most people would see this artwork and immediately say that's a portrait. You know, if you had to categorize it, he used the word landscape. So it's a landscape in that it's long horizontal. It represents space and a place and it has trees. Um, we could argue that it has sky and ground and depth. Um, he actually includes the portraits though. And I thought that was include, uh, important to think about because Immediately when we think of portrait, we might think of likeness. What do we look like? Like our school snapshot, our official school portrait. Um, but it could also mean what, what is around us? What is the stuff around us, the culture and all the, the things that surround us as well. Things that we use, things that we eat um, could all be considered part of our, um, our likeness. Okay, so next, this is another one that I think most people, they see it from across the room, would not look at it and say, that's a portrait. This is titled Portrait Genovese by Jackie Sicoccio. And she's an artist who just passed away two years ago. And she um, did a whole series of portraits um, that she called portraits. They're abstract, so it's not a blurry screen. It really is drips and layers and layers of poured paint mixed with mica on linen. It's 106 inches tall. So it's a tall painting, it's large abstraction. Um, all the pieces have a general sort of oval shape in them. And you can see uh, maybe some, um, some neutral colors that might remind you of flesh tones. Um, but I don't see any eyes, I don't see a nose or lips or ears or hair. Um, anything that we would typically include in a portrait. And um, this is a snapshot we show on tours because um, a lot of people, when you say, you know, like Genoa in Italy, they don't necessarily recognize that um, architecture or the lighting, um, but that's what inspired the artist. And she is third generation Italian American, um, traveled to Italy quite a bit and thought the colors and shapes reminded her of that place. And so that was her portrait of Genoa. Um, this is the grouping of portraits that she had on view at the museum a few years ago. Um, and we were lucky to have one donated to our collection. Okay, so this one might be labeled a portrait by somebody who walks in, sees it across the room, um, coming up closer, looking at the face in the middle. It's a memorial portrait. This is by Roberto Lugo. And he um, titled this Kobe Urn. It's a portrait of Kobe Bryant and it was made in 2020. Um, we have um, the likeness of the face. We also have the championship ring that's right underneath the face right here. I don't know if you can see my little arrow. Can you see my arrow? Ooh, I'm going around the ring right in the, underneath his face. Um, we also have the colors, the team colors for the Lakers, the purple and yellow. Um, so there's elements of portraiture that allude to the, um, the identity of the, the subject. So I have um, a couple other images I like to show. When we're on the tour, I'll hold up a reproduction um, so people can see another work by the artist in addition to um, the portrait of the artist. And um, I also might show um, a photograph of the subject. So you can say, okay, well, Kobe Bryant, a lot of people know who he is, but not everyone does. Um, so I might, uh, you know, hold up a picture that I printed off of the source material. You can see the likeness. Um, and then another work is the one on the um, the right. This is a portrait that the artist made that is um, a little bit more than life size. So it's a really big ceramic piece. Um, the silhouette is a portrait of the artist. So. Roberto Lugo looking at himself, that's his silhouette, the head on the top, the body, and then the feet towards the bottom. And then it's a homage to Michael Brown, 
and the title of it is, Do You Know How Hard It Is to Get a Black Man Through High School? So we like to show that as another example of a portrait memorial. And then here's a portrait of the artist. And I wanted to show a um, short clip. We have a 15 minute long interview that he did with us for our third Thursday program. And I'm just gonna show um, a short bit so you can hear him talk about his work and his identity. To graduate school, which was a whole different experience. But there was one critique that really hit me hard, and it was my wife had a critique with a portrait of me, and someone referred to me as a Mexican gangster. And it wasn't really anything that I had that looked like a Mexican gangster. So, you know, it just made me feel like no matter what I do, people are going to see me this way, right? And so from that experience, I decided to start making pottery. Um, I went to the library and I saw this Worcester pot, and I thought to myself, man, this pot looks really expensive. And I thought about the fact that at the time, porcelain was considered more expensive than gold. So how is it that I could like, um, you know, make that work in response to what I was going through? And one of the things I decided was that I would um, start to put my personal face on the pots that I was making. Sorry, I always keep talking about it. Um, <clears throat> and so this is actually my first example that I made at the Kansas City Art Institute. And, um, uh, off the top of my head, I forget who the, the name of the, the person that owns it, but uh, he's a local Kansas City uh, collector, um, <clears throat> and a, a great family and a great collection to be a part of, John Paul. Um, <clears throat> so this started me on this track of like thinking about how to put my face in a place that didn't belong. And um, I also started to think about the responsibility of my work, coming from where I come from and, and having the opportunities that I did, I want to be able to give back. And one of the things I kept thinking about was like, what does that look like? Because if I'm making pots for people that come from where I come from, I feel like it's similar to gentrification, kind of like putting in things that don't already exist within my culture and community and saying, look, we need this. Like your culture is, is you know, isn't good enough. They need, you know, this particular thing. So um, one of the elements that I thought about was not only putting my face on a piece, um, but also putting other people of color and things that are representative of the culture that I came in for. Because one of the things that graffiti tells us is that people want to represent where they come from, especially a lot of graffiti rooms have, you know, zip codes or, I mean, area codes of where it is that the people are doing graffiti from. So I decided to start um, throwing pottery in the street and just seeing what would happen if I, as a person of color who comes from that neighborhood, starts to throw pottery um, you know, what in essence would happen organically when I, my image becomes part of the natural and cultural landscape of the, of the community. All right, so here's a um, closer picture of the self-portrait that he made um, showing himself on the pottery. So it really is great to kind of look at how um, it really doesn't matter the media. It doesn't matter, um, you know, nobody is limited in terms of portraiture. It could be on ceramics, it could be on a mural, it could be on a canvas. Um, also, the likeness could vary from photorealistic to a color or a place or an object that reminds you of a person. Um, so I always like to do that, kind of, kind of think about people's um, definitions of what art is and then how contemporary artists play with that definition and sometimes stretch. Okay, so next, um, going along with that kind of standard, what is a portrait? Um, I really enjoyed working with several Kennedy Center artists um, through our partners in education with the college performing arts educators. And um, we have had Melanie Rick out a few times to do some workshops with arts integration. Um, and the one that she likes to use the most, it seems I've, I've seen most frequently, is the Pass the Portrait game and reading portraiture. So I'm going to let you listen to her. Um, and again, focus in on what makes a portrait. Is it facial expression? It could also be clothing, viewpoint, setting, gesture, and objects. And she has all these, all these great little um, gestures to make along with those elements that um, she recommends teaching the kids to get the kinesthetic learners more engaged 
And those are some great things that um, I've learned from working with performing arts educators that it doesn't come naturally to me as a visual art person. So it's always good to um, stretch ourselves in that way. So here's Melanie talking about her workshop. I think it's really powerful for us to consider how we can begin lessons and units of study and conversations through the reading of an image first. So if we teach students how to truly decode a work of art, how to read a work of art in a very fluent way, then we can begin to um, make meaning so that students are able to activate and build their background knowledge, have a mental image in their mind so that they actually are learning from that image um, no matter their reading level and they're engaging with content um, in a way that's accessible to all. Um, the visual images also give students um, you know, a reason to read and research. So if I look at the illustrations and I genuinely notice the details of the facial expression, I notice the focal point on where the eyes are um, looking both as a viewer and a person perhaps in a portrait. Um, if I notice in a portrait what the person's body is doing, what they're wearing, where they are in any of the objects within that portrait of students, or I look at an image with such great detail, then um, we're able to comprehend it at such a higher level so that we um, gain a significant amount of information just from reading the image. So I think by reading images um, with our students, we are helping them to access the curriculum and um, our higher level learners are gonna read it in a very metaphorical symbolic way while our other learners are able to access and read that visual text so that we're naturally differentiating the learning for our students through the reading languages. Okay, so she went through that really quickly. Um, and I'm going to try to go through it one more time. Um, this is something, again, that I've had to practice quite a bit because it doesn't come naturally to me, but it's a really great way of getting the students more involved. So looking at a portrait, we've got the facial expression. She kind of moves her hand around her face. We've got viewpoint, where are the eyes going? What are the eyes looking at? We've got clothing. And she tugs at her shoulders a little bit. And um, we've got setting and she kind of makes a little box with her fingers and gesture. How are our arms moving or the rest of our body and also um, objects. So there are different ways of kind of analyzing the portrait using those elements. And so let's go back to sharing screen. And I want to to show um, another one of the great things about virtual tours is we can show pictures of artwork that isn't on view. It's in storage, maybe we just got it from the artist, hasn't been framed, hasn't been put out in a display yet. Um, so this is a work that we just acquired and I haven't seen it yet in person. The artist is Genevieve Gagnard and it's called Lace Front Lawn. And it's a C print that's 24 by 36 inches. 
So looking through this, I really hope people will talk to me because I really don't like doing a tour where I'm lecturing the whole time. <laughs> so what do you all think about her facial expression? What words would you use to describe that facial expression of hers? Skeptical. Yeah, her eyebrows are kind of raised and she's looking off to the side. Any other thoughts on her facial expression? Does she look happy? Does she look maybe annoyed or upset? Maybe uneasy. Yeah, she's she's not smiling, that's for sure. Eyes wide, not smiling, looking up, great. Um, we also have um, her viewpoint. She's not looking directly at the camera, uh, the person taking the picture, maybe the person behind uh, the scene. Um, or somebody across the street. Um, we have a uh, setting. What can, information can we gather from the setting? Stepford Wives, like a <clears throat> bougie neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, maybe things are a little too pretty um, with the uh, groomed lawn and landscaping. Um, the flowers that are very colorful, um, the uh, the shutters that are that kind of like Smurf blue. <laughs> I don't know how you describe that kind of perfect blue. All right, and her clothing. Um, for me, I feel like the uh, pearl necklace. I just had a conversation about this with my students, and like, first of all, they think only old people wear pearls, um, and then second of all, they think it's a status symbol. Like they're like, yeah, if you have a necklace like that on, like not this particular one, but we were talking about pearls in another painting. They're like, that means that you've got money. Sure. Yeah, it's a luxury. Um, she's also got uh, extra long hair that's kind of perfect. Um, so she's she spent some time on putting this look together. And her lipstick matches the flowers and her and her outfit too. Okay. So um, this is another portrait from her series. Um, that I, I just wanted to show it's called Hidden Fences. And this one is not in the collection, but it's the same outfit, same setting, just gives us a little more context there. So this one, she's gesturing is very important in this one, right? She's got that kind of posed, look at my face, look at my outfit. Great, so let's watch a really quick video so you can hear more about Genevieve from herself. I'm not able to tell my whole story through like one medium. So I access all these different ways of working. I work in photography, installation, as we're sitting in here, collage and sculpture. So I photograph myself to talk about how we navigate through the world, how others see us. I usually pass as white, but I identify as a woman of color. My mom is white and my dad is black. This particular space, Although it's kind of upbeat and bright and inviting, it's actually honoring the memory of my niece who passed away in a house fire a few years ago. Some of the objects in this particular space are from like my childhood. My aesthetic is pulled from my mom and like the things I grew up around. It's kind of this retro vibe. My MC Hammer doll is floating around somewhere over there. <laughs> my original cabbage patch is in the mix there on the bed. I thought about making this spectrum of blackness because it's assumed that black is one visible thing, but it's, it's a kind of gradient, if you will. In one sense, it's talking about race, but in another sense, it's talking about loss, things that reference passing on, a woman coming of age or a girl coming of age, these expectations of what is beautiful. The process might start with finding a wallpaper and the carpeting and all of these things act as like almost a time machine when they all come together because I'm interested in how you can play with time. A lot of people talk about, you know, we've come a long way and like we've dealt with a lot of issues, especially with race. At the end of the day, we actually haven't come as far as we'd like to pretend we have. Kind of placing the person in a past but in the, in the present.
All right. So after watching that, um, would you consider this a self-portrait of the artist? Or is this, it's a portrait, but maybe not a self-portrait, and then it doesn't tell us much about her identity as much as her other work? So I really connected with the part of the video where um, she was kind of talking about her heritage and how she feels like she's white passing. Um, and so for maybe people who aren't familiar, that would be somebody who does have heritage um, that is multi-ethnic, but can pass as a white person. And so there's a lot of conversations around privilege with that. But um, for me, like this looks like she's playing a part. And so like, I really connected with that um, part in her video and how this might be related in some ways to that. Right. Yeah. Cause it is, um, it's personal in that way, but maybe not autobiographical. Um, when you think of a, a personal portrait or a self portrait, um, you know, and her work has been compared to Cindy Sherman who puts on a different role. Um, and it is a portrait of a person, but it's not necessarily telling us about her biography as much as her other works, you know, her other works that had the, the dolls and the family portraits and the books, so in that case, the objects in that installation maybe told us more about the artist than the likeness. So this is another work that we acquired recently, uh, and it's called Vogue Number no. One Sin City from 2017. Um, it's also a C print that's 36 by 53. Um, so you can see how she plays with different wigs and different outfits. Um, this one we might have gesture as a really important element of the portrait. Um, setting is very different um, than that, you know, manicured suburbia. Here we have kind of a luxurious overview um, of Vegas. And all right, I do have a chat. Um, sorry, I'm not, <laughs> it's kind of hard to see the chat as we go. So um, you're good, Karen. We thank you for you. <laughs> okay. So I think Lori was just kind of chiming in through the chat on that last one. Great. Okay, so I've got a few um, that I'm going to zip through a little quicker because we're just about running out of time. Um, let's see. There we go. This is a portrait of Marilyn Monroe um, by Eve Arnold from 1960. And Eve Arnold is an artist who um, was alive from 1913 to 2012. And she took a lot of pictures of the actress and developed a personal friendship with her. Um, this one is nine by 13 inches, it's a platinum print. Um, hasn't been on view in about 10 years, but I hope we get to see it again. Um, so this one, we have the setting, um, we have the, uh, the object behind her that shows us it's a movie set. And she's got this great kind of gesture of vulnerability, looking away from the person taking the picture. Um, the outfit uh, is, it's part of her, her wardrobe. Um, it is from the Misfits with Clark Gable. So she was shooting the movie, very, very insecure about herself. Um, and Eve Arnold felt like she was able to connect with her personally because she developed that, um, that friendship. And then um, there we have another Marilyn Monroe, and that's part of Roger Shimomura's print that's called Kabuki Party. And Roger Shimomura is a third generation Japanese American artist who's based in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, this is from 1988 and it shows um, Marilyn's publicity image, which is very confident and glamorous, maybe compared to the, um, the more candid picture that Eve Arnold took. And she's got um, the, uh, the stylization that came from Andy Warhol mass producing her image. And then Roger has mass produced that as well. So we've got the Liechtenstein um, and, uh, and the Kabuki actor on the side too. So we've got objects representing people and, um, and two different cultures that are represented there as well. And this is a portrait of the artist Cara Romero, who is married to Diego Romero. He made this portrait called Coche di Cara in 2017. It's a lithograph, it's 24 inches square. And um, it shows the, so the artist's wife in the the costume and the gesture of power um, taking on Wonder Woman. Um, and uh, Diego Romero loves using comic imagery um, as well as contemporary and history um, combined in his own narrative works. 
And this is a bolo tie that just we re, ugh, sorry recently went on view in our library second floor case. We have new cases where we have about 30 pieces from the Native American jewelry collection. Um, and this is by an artist named Marcus Ammerman, who's Choctaw. And he made this um, Barack Obama bolo tie based on the Shepherd Fairy poster for Obama. And here's a detail of the beads. So you can see that um, pixelated uh, portrait there, stylized with the colors based on the Shepherd Fairy image. Um, there you go. So you can see the original photographic portrait and then the artist representation, and then it reinterpreted in the beadwork. So imagine um, what kind of statement you're wearing if you put on a portrait on your outfit, you know, whether it's a t-shirt or a piece of jewelry like this that has a portrait of somebody, it's showing that you identify with them. It's kind of a, a hero. Um, here's a detail of another beaded work. I'm just gonna zip through since we're just about out of time. Um, I like to show details of texture of artwork when you're not there in person to see it because that's what we really miss when we're not um, interacting with the artwork in the museum. So you can see we've got the jingle bells, we've got the beads and also some fur and fuzzy fabric. So it gives you more of a tactile sense of the piece. Um, this is a portrait by Ken Williams and it is um, called Strength to Overcome. And you know, thinking about wearing something with somebody that you really admire, this is the artist's great, great, great grandfather um, that he has reproduced in portrait form in a beaded bag. And there's a source image that we like to show people. So it's based on a photograph, it's pictorial beadwork. Um, the artist has definitely embellished in terms of color and textures and multimedia there. Um, but he told us when he made this for our collection that he was going through a hard time and really was drawing strength from his, um, his relatives and all that, um, all that they went through. And there's the whole thing. So you can see all the different um, media that he's used to surround the portrait and kind of frame it. This is another work by Ken Williams called He Was Iconic. So instead of a family member in this portrait, he has um, really memorialized one of his mentors and his teachers. This is Charles Laloma, a Hopi artist um, who's known for his jewelry making. And uh, when we talk about the title, He Was Iconic, it's like, what was an icon? And our art history students like to um, make connections with their medieval art class looking at um, how do you show an icon? How do you show somebody's important? Putting a gold halo around them is usually a way to draw attention. Um, this is a, one of the medieval manuscripts. Um, and there's a piece of jewelry that Charles Loma made that we have in our permanent collection. Um, he was very, uh, very modern in style. Um, and that piece is also in the library jewelry case. Um, so finally, this is the last work. Um, or source material for the last work, looking at beads. And um, this is a um, Cheyenne bag on the left that has um, a traditional pattern and colors um, of trade beads. And those are trade beads from the Steamboat Arabia Museum. So I like to show pictures of these when we're looking at the painting um, by Jordan Ann Craig. And this is a painting that's about 70 inches. So it's a large abstract painting, very flat in style with the, um, the color applied in a very even way. Um, and then I've got a very quick video that I want to show to hear the artist talk about it because I bet zero out of 100 people would look at this and say that's a portrait, but listen to her talk about her work and you might change your mind. My name is Jordan Ann Craig. I'm Northern Cheyenne and I was born and raised in Northern California. So the type of art I make are large abstract paintings and prints. So I like to study indigenous design, whether that's beadwork, basket weaving, um, textile design, and I'll make my own versions of those patterns. I ended up studying art in college, and now I've been pursuing it ever since. I get my ideas from just my own experiences, my time with my family, um, just seeing colors that I really like wherever I'm out and about. A lot of my paintings are quite abstract and pattern-based, but each of them is rooted in some sort of story. I directly uh, utilize my Northern Cheyenne background to find, research different objects and patterns to make paintings of. 
So these paintings are um, mostly designing from beadwork and so from moccasins and baby carriers and other indigenous objects that are part of my culture. So I'm using those beads, those little tiny beads, and I'm making these really abstract, simplified patterns based on those objects. And my background is really um, different because my mother was adopted. And so this is like our returning to our own culture. I know the appropriation of Native culture is an ongoing problem. And it's something that through my own work and also through my own passions in the fashion business, is something that I'm constantly fighting and trying to you know, utilize my representation to actually put real Native work out there. So Native inspired work versus actual Native work, there's a huge difference. And so I think utilizing artists that are you know, of Indigenous descent who have those cultural values, who are actually, you know, native, we should be supporting and uplifting those artists. My piece for Rumpel is a piece I originally designed for my sister Bailey. The piece is uh, mostly monochromatic bowls. Um, you know, it's it's got different indigenous elements with inside the patterns and designs, and it's all through my own aesthetics as well. I really do hope my work can inspire younger women, younger artists, younger, older, native people, whatever, it, whoever's seeing my work. Yeah, but I think in the future, just seeing that I'm pursuing this can hopefully inspire other young artists. All right, well, that was a very quick tour of 10 artists. Um, usually in an hour, we prepare to show 10 artworks, but we get to six because we're hoping to have good discussion with everybody um, and take our time if there's people who have questions about artwork. Um, so that's um, harder to do with a virtual tour, but I hope that gives you a good kind of overview of different portraits, um, different kind of techniques how we might categorize something as a portrait when at first you don't see a face even. Um, so here's, I just had a couple of quick images of some uh, different portrait lessons we've done at the museum. Recently, we had a group of fifth graders come out from Olathe and they made um, transfer images by using a um, wet erase marker on a transparency sheet on a mirror and kind of tracing their image and then stamping it um, with the spritz of water. and. Uh, using beads and other embellishments on a um, foam core frame. Um, so they were looking at different likenesses and art as well on their tours and then um, connecting it back in the studio um, for that special, special engagement that we had. Um, we've also done uh, classes, which is just a two hour lesson that includes a tour. Puzzle portraits um, was one we did um, also with the Shawnee Mission Middle School teachers of several years ago, and um, looking at the artwork of Lester Goldman, where he actually used uh, repurposed paper bags. So that was another piece that walked down the hallway. I bet most people would walk by and not see a person, um, but he was thinking about people when he was making it. Um, uh, different ways of rearranging your um, facial features in an abstract collage. And then here's a, um, a couple examples of using styrofoam plates to um, draw markers uh, with a, a likeness um, superheroes for the younger kids and then more of a self-portrait for the older kids. Um, finally, this was pop art portraits where we um, look through magazines for ads for like our favorite food or some other um, advertisement or uh, something we were wearing with the character on it to make a portrait and uh, make it more personal. So that's all I have. And I was hoping that we would have a moment just for anybody to share if they had um, created something or just um, enjoyed. <laughs> Thank you, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Yay, I love it. You've got lots of little dots there. What did you use to make those dots? Is that glue? Uh, no, I'm like obsessed with these tulip paints right now. I can't stop putting them everywhere. But Coffee paint. I was feeling inspired. So I grabbed a grocery list. I grabbed a tram ticket from my last vacation and then a watercolor that I had done. And then I found an old Polaroid photo from 
like five years ago, I think, and decided to make that like the base. Oh, that's great. So kind of a narrative with that. Anybody else want to share? All right, well, I'll share mine. Um, so I had taken my family portrait and I've added a couple of collage elements. We've got Irish American heritage. Um, so the shamrock, it also kind of symbolizes our 4-H because that's what my boys are into these days. Um, and I'll keep adding to it because I, I really love thinking about how um, patterns and textures and symbols, objects, those could all be elements of your portrait. So it's not all about looking just like you um, or your family. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that, you know, thinking about your, um, your heritage and favorite colors and how you talk about your artwork sometimes is really important and, and not just what it looks like. So. Hey, Karen, do you have a slide that has like the, the thingy, the five things that we look for at portraits? Yeah, it's on, it's on the slideshow. Okay. Awesome. I can't wait to start using that. Cause I feel like all kids do is look at the face. And right, we right. also look for, but I like when it's spelled out that I can be really intentional about like, okay, we're going through five steps of this. And I feel like our social studies teachers probably need to take a, a note from us because they always try to unpack history through images, you know? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Melanie is, is very into arts integration with English as well as social studies and looking at portraits kind of as like a primary source um, for information. So um, sometimes artists, you know, they take so many liberties that you can't just read it verbatim and and say it's all fact but um but it's definitely uh, you know part of the the visual culture and the history Absolutely. well thank you thank you karen um i'm gonna 